Chapter 13 My dear Wormwood, It seems to me that you take a great many pages to tell a very simple story. The long and the short of it is that you have let the man slip through your fingers. The situation is very grave. I really see no reason why I should try to shield you from the consequences of your inefficiency. A repentance and renewal of what the other side call grace, on a scale which you describe as a defeat of the first order. It amounts to a second conversion, and probably on a deeper level than the first. As you ought to have known, the asphyxiating cloud which prevented your attacking the patient on his walk back from the old mill is a well-known phenomenon. It is the enemy's most barbarous weapon and generally appears when he is directly present to the patient under certain modes not yet fully classified. Some humans are permanently surrounded by it and therefore inaccessible to us. And now for your blunders. On your own showing, you first of all allowed the patient to read a book he really enjoyed. Because he enjoyed it, and not in order to make some clever remark about it to his new friends. In the second place, you allowed him to walk down to the old mill and have tea there, a walk through country he really likes, and taken alone. In other words, you allowed him two real positive pleasures. Were you so ignorant as not to see the danger of this? The characteristic of pains and pleasures is they are unmistakably real. And therefore, as far as they go, give the man who feels them a touchstone with reality. Thus, if you had been trying to damn your man by the romantic method, by making him a kind of Childe Harold or Werther, submerged in self-pity for imaginary distresses, you would try to protect him at all cost from any real pain, because, of course, five minutes' genuine toothache would reveal the romantic sorrows for the nonsense they were and unmask your whole stratagem. But you are trying to damn your patient by the world, that is, by palming off vanity, bustle, irony, and expensive tedium as pleasures. How can you have failed to see that a real pleasure was the last thing you ought to have let him meet? Didn't you foresee that it would just kill, by contrast, all the trumpery which you have been so laboriously teaching him to value. And that sort of pleasure which the book and the walk gave him was the most dangerous of all. That it would peel off from his sensibility the kind of crust that you had been forming on it and make him feel that he was coming home, recovering himself, as a preliminary to detaching him from the enemy, you wanted to detach him from himself, and had made some progress in doing so. Now, all of that is undone. Of course, I know that the enemy also wants to detach men from themselves, but in a different way. Remember always that he really likes the little vermin, and sets an absurd value on the distinctness of every one of them. When he talks of their losing their selves, he only means abandoning the clamor of self-will. Once they have done that, he really gives them back all their personality and boasts. I am afraid, sincerely, that when they are wholly his, they will be more themselves than ever. Hence, when he is delighted to see them sacrificing even their innocent wills to his... He hates to see them drifting away from their own nature for any other reason. We should always encourage them to do so. The deepest likings and impulses of any man are the raw material, the starting point with which the enemy has furnished him. 
To get him away from those is therefore always a point to be gained, even in things uh, indifferent. It is always desirable to substitute the standards of the world, or convention, or fashion, for a human's own real likings and dislikings. I myself would carry this very far. I would make it a rule to eradicate from my patient any strong personal taste, which is not actually a sin, even if it is something quite trivial, such as a uh, fondness for country cricket, or collecting stamps, or, or drinking cocoa. Such things, I grant you, have nothing of virtue in them, but there is a sort of innocence and humility and self-forgetfulness about them which I distrust. The man who truly and disinterestedly enjoys any one thing in the world for its own sake and without caring tuppence what other people say about it is by that fact forearmed against some of our subtlest modes of attack. You should always try to make the patient abandon the people or food or books he really likes in favor of the best people or the right food, the important books. I have known a human defended from strong temptations to social ambition by a still stronger taste for tripe and onions. It remains to consider how we shall recover from this disaster, the great thing is to prevent his doing anything. As long as he does not convert it into action, it does not matter how much he thinks about this new repentance. Let the little brute wallow in it. Let him, if he has any bent that way, write a book about it. That is often an excellent way of sterilizing the seeds which the enemy plants in a human soul. Let him do anything. But act. No amount of piety in his imagination and affections will harm us if we can keep it out of his will. As one of the humans has said, active habits are strengthened by repetition, but passive ones are weakened. The more often he feels without acting, the less he will ever be able to act. And in the long run, the less he will be able to feel. Your affectionate uncle, Screwtape.